Amen. So keep your place there in Jeremiah chapter 42. So that is going to be the context of our next sermon in the series, Egypt. So tonight we are going to talk about um, going to Egypt for safety, for comfort. Uh, we looked at going to Egypt last week or the week before in the first sermon on going to Egypt for power, for horses and chariots. And tonight we're going to look at going to Egypt for safety. In Jeremiah chapter 42, let's get a little bit of context to this story. So Jeremiah is a prophet to the lower kingdom of Judah. All right, he is a prophet during the Babylonian captivity. So he was a prophet before the captivity, and then he was a prophet also when they were in the captivity, and Jeremiah stayed back in Judah. Remember, not everyone was taken off in the three exiles to Babylon. Some people remained, and there was actually Babylonian rulers that were put over Judah. And now these are the people that are remaining, and they're asking Jeremiah, what should we do, especially since one of the um, people, um, the, the governor that uh, Nebuchadnezzar put over the, um, the kingdom of Judah or um, Jerusalem there, um, had been killed. All right, So they were worried of the ramifications of the, the Babylonians over the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, they were worried about what was going to happen. So they went to Jeremiah. And, you know, just a, a kind of a, uh, an overview of Jeremiah's life is no one ever listened to him. All right. So I don't feel bad as a pastor if, you know, you know, preaching goes in one ear and out the other. Look, I don't want you to do that. But no one listened to Jeremiah ever. Not one time. All right. They come to him now after he's been yelling for years that, you know, if we don't get right, we're going to be taken into captivity. We're going to be crushed as a nation. People called him a traitor. They put him in jail. They tried to kill him, all these different things. And then finally, it actually happens. And now in Jeremiah chapter 42, it's, it's such a great chapter because these people, they come to him and they're like, tell us what to do. We'll do whatever you say. Tell us what to do. And then, of course, he gives them the answer that they don't want to hear and they don't listen anyway. All right. So they're like, hey, we'll do whatever we want, you know, and they, they're like, as long as it's the answer that we want to hear. All right. And it wasn't the answer that they wanted to hear. Look down at Jeremiah chapter 42 and look at verse 13. If you just look up one verse in uh, chapter number 41, you can see why they're so concerned. It says, and they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham in verse 17, which is by Bethlehem to go and to enter into Egypt because of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, for they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon had made governor in the land. So the governor was killed by one of them, and they're afraid of you know, Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to this. All right, look at verse number 13 of Jeremiah chapter number 42. But if ye say, now they're telling Jeremiah, we're going to listen to you no matter what. All right? And they say, if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt. This is, this is God's answer. All right? This is the answer that came to Jeremiah after 10 days from the Lord. And it's, look, it's a very clear answer. There's no gray area here. God is saying, don't go there. All right? He's saying, don't go to Egypt. If you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt where we shall see no war. What are they going there for? They're going there for safety. They're going there for protection. They're going there for comfort. Nor hear the sound of a trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there we will dwell. And now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, If ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, to stay there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. So it shall be with all the men that set their faces to go into Egypt to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. And none of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring upon them. God is literally saying, if you go there for safety, you will not have any safety. And it's not even one of those things where it's like, well, maybe some of us will make it. 
He's saying, not one of you will make it. And God is saying, I will make sure that none of you make it. Look at this in verse number 18. For the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, talking about the captivity here, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you. Look, these people survived the captivity. Okay? He's saying, you survived the captivity. Babylon came in. They took over. You made it. He's like, but now I'm going to pour my wrath upon you specifically if you do this, this remnant that is still in the land. When you, when you shall enter into Egypt, and you shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach, and you shall see this place no more. Look at verse 19. The Lord has said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according unto all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto you, and we shall do it. So he said, you were, you know, you were, not, you were not honest with me when you came and you said, whatever you want, you know, whatever God says, we'll listen. He's like, you were, not, you were being disingenuous, is what he said. Look at verse uh, 21. I, now I've declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, nor anything for which he has sent me unto you. Now, therefore, know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place where ye desire to go and to sojourn. So, what I want to talk about tonight is what happened with these people specifically, and I want to apply that to the world as we look at this sermon series of Egypt and how the Bible uses Egypt to, you know, kind of look as a metaphor to the world that we live in. And I want to talk about relying on the world for safety because it works exactly the same way. And that's why Jeremiah chapter 42 is given to us in the Bible. Turn to Psalm chapter 4 and verse number 8. There's so many verses in the Bible talking about relying only on the Lord. I'll just read for you just a couple tonight. But there's, it's a major theme in the Bible. God wants us to rely on him. Look at Psalm chapter 4. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says this. So, look, we are not to rely on the world for safety, yet the exact, that's exactly what we end up doing many times. Look at Psalm chapter 4 and verse number 8. The Bible is very clear that God wants us to rely on him. Verse number 8 of Psalm chapter 4. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Saying, it is only you, Lord, that keeps me safe. Go to Ephesians chapter number 6. Actually, you just go to Psalm chapter 28, verse number 7. I'll read for you Ephesians 6, 11, where the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Meaning all the armor, and then it goes to list the armor of God that um, we should put on. But the point being, it all comes from the Lord. All right. It doesn't come from Egypt or the world. Look at Psalm chapter 28. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says this, and we saw this again this morning with the Lord being our buckler, but the Lord says, the Lord is my strength and my shield, meaning the Lord is my protection, all right? My heart trusteth in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. So the first point I have tonight is this. Turn to Daniel chapter number three. Turn to Daniel chapter number three. So we're not to rely on the world for safety. All right. So what does that mean for our safety in this world? And that's what I want to bring you to on my first point. My first point on safety tonight and not relying, not going to Egypt for safety is on earth, you may be protected by God. You may. Look at Daniel chapter number three and verse number 16. This is a story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not worship um, the image um, in verse number 16, you know, they're going to be killed for this, but they're, you know, they're being threatened with death if they don't worship this image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. What does that mean? It doesn't mean like we're not careful. It means like we're not in a gray area here. We're not thinking about it. We're not like debating whether or not we should worship 
you know, this, or bow down to this statue. It just says, we're not going to do it. That's what they're saying. It's like, it's not, it's not a decision for us. The decision is made. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But I love this. Look at verse number 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image without which thou hast set up. So they're saying, God may protect us. God is able to protect us. He might do it, if it be so. But, it, you know, but then they say in verse number 18, I'm glad verse number 18 is in there, and I'm glad that these men said this. Because, but if not, we're not going to do it anyway. So God may protect them, and he may not protect them. And of course, we know the rest of the story that God did protect them. But look, either way, they were not bowing down to that statue. They were not going to, if they would have said, okay, we'll do it, and just please don't kill us, that would have been going to Egypt for safety. But they said, no, 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 we're not going to Egypt for safety. We're going to stay with the Lord, and it may or may not protect our lives on this earth. But look, this is why people go to Egypt for safety. Because what do people want? They don't want what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. They want a guarantee of safety. That's what people want in this world. They want to know that they're going to be safe. They want a guarantee of physical protection. And that's why these people in Jeremiah chapter 42 ultimately went to Egypt. The problem, though, is this. Turn to Psalm, or actually turn to Proverbs chapter number 21. The problem is this. Safety is not in Egypt. Safety is not in the world. The world promises safety, but it's not really there. That's the problem. Look at Proverbs chapter 21 and look at verse 31. I just love this verse in the Bible. It's just got such, I love the balance of this verse. I love just the completeness of this verse. Look at verse 31 of Proverbs 21. The Bible says, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. I love the balance here. It's basically saying like, hey, you know, be prepared. Be ready for things. Don't walk into things blind. Don't be foolish. But ultimately, whether or not we are safe, that's up to God. That's in God's hands. I mean, I, I use this all the time when we talk about soul winning. You know, when we're talking about soul winning, maybe somebody becomes a new soul winner and they can't believe the neighborhoods that we go into on a regular basis. You know, we go into, as, as soul winners, we go into neighborhoods that most people would probably not visit on a, on a regular basis. But as a soul winner, you kind of get excited about going into those types of neighborhoods. But look, here's the thing. And guess what? As we've gone into those types of neighborhoods, you know, the worst neighborhoods, you know, what people would call the worst neighborhoods, we've never had serious trouble. We've never really had problems. As hundreds, yea, thousands of soul winners go out um, every week, and we tend towards, you know, those types of neighborhoods that people would call dangerous out there. But we've never had serious trouble. And I've used that statement many times. Safety is of the Lord. Safety is of the Lord. But look, we're, not, we're also not <clears throat> we're also not going to those neighborhoods at 10 o'clock at night. You know, we're not going to those neighborhoods on Saturday at 10 o'clock at night when there's like a, you know, a car sideshow or something going on. We're not doing that. You know, we're not being silly and, and you know, we're being prepared. We're, we're being, you know, thoughtful. We're thinking about things. We have different, you know, we have very organized ways that we go soul winning and we keep track of people. We keep track of the ladies on one side of the street and all these different things. But look, the point is this, be prepared. Be prepared, think about things, protect your family, have, you know, things that you can do and be a capable individual. But look, you're to be prepared, not paranoid. You're to be prepared because being paranoid and stopping yourselves from going to those types of neighborhoods and being like, well, I don't know, that doesn't seem like it'd be safe. Look, safety is of the Lord. You don't want to be so safe that you're not effective as a Christian because safety is of God. 
I mean, if, it, if, if your safety starts affecting your fruitfulness, you know, you're, you're, going to the, you're going to Egypt, a little too far into Egypt for safety, all right? Ultimately, this verse means be prepared, but safety is up to God. Just as Daniel chapter 3 said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, look, we're not doing it. We're sticking with the Lord. We're sticking with what we know we're supposed to do, and our safety is of the Lord, period. It's up to him on what he does. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 36. But guess what? The world promises safety. The world, Egypt, promises safety. Falsely, though. They falsely promised safety. Look at Isaiah chapter 36 and verse number 6. Here we see another verse, but I love the way this is, this is put. This is basically comparing, you know, trusting in the safety of God versus the safety of the world. Look at verse number 6. It says, Lo, thou trustest, trusteth in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that what? Trust in him. So, I mean, here's the picture of this verse. The picture of this verse is this, there's this staff, this strong, you know, reed, you know, and, and, but you're, and you're, you're trusting on it, you're leaning upon it, but the Bible is saying, but it's broken. But it's broken, it's got a, it's got a shard on the end, and if you lean on it, you trust on it, it's just going to stab you through. It's just going to pierce you through. So the world, look, turn to Colossians chapter 2, and verse number 8. The first point tonight is that the world has many false promises of safety. You say, what do you mean? I'm not going to go to Egypt, and I, I don't trust in the world. I trust in the Lord. The world has so many false promises of safety. And I'll just give you a few examples tonight. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. Look down at verse number 8. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse number eight. Actually, I mean, just think of institutions before we even get to this verse. Just think of the institutions that we deal with in our world today that promise safety. I mean, doesn't, I mean, the public school is the first one that would just pop into my mind. I mean, just like, you don't have to worry. Like, we got your kids. No problem. We'll take care of everything. I mean, that's a joke to this crowd, but look, that institution promises safety. But is there safety there? Think about it. Think about the, just the, the assault, I mean, the literal assault statistics in the public school system. I mean, like, it's, I don't even know what the current statistics are, but like, a high percentage of kids are assaulted both physically and the other way in public school. There is no safety there. It's total Egypt. And you just, you know, put all the philosophies that they're teaching in, into these kids' heads. There's no safety at all in those institutions. Look down at verse number eight. It says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. You see that? And vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Look, all these different philosophies out there of the world, these are Egypt. These are promises of safety where there is no safety. These are the, philo the, the new philosophies that... That, you know, all of a sudden we just, we decided we just figured these out a few years ago. That just go against all of civilization for thousands of years. I mean, forget even the Bible. You think about the philosophy of uh, feminism. That's a philosophy. You think about the philosophy of feminism. What are they doing? They're promising safety to young women. They're saying, oh, you're going to be abused and you're going to be discriminated against. You must adopt this philosophy, in order to be safe from the, this evil, you know, misogynistic world that's out there, you must adopt this philosophy. But what does that philosophy do? It just destroys young women. It destroys an entire generation of young women. It destroys marriage. It destroys, look, it destroys young men as well. As reactions to this philosophy that promises safety, reactions, you know, you get this manosphere that pops up on the other side, reacting to that, you know, philosophy. So you get these two godless competing philosophies that just destroy young men and young women together. But there is no safety there, but that's what they promise. 
I mean, young ladies are just, they're terrified into feminism. You have to adopt this or you will be abused and be used. And I mean, it's just, it's the opposite of the truth. All these philosophies out there. And here, how about this one? Look down at verse number eight again. Look at this phrase here. After the tradition of men. You know what another thing that people go to for safety in Egypt is? Traditions. Traditions that they have. People have traditions. That you say, what's wrong with traditions? Turn to Mark chapter number seven. Turn to Mark chapter number seven. Jesus talked about this one a lot. Just traditions of men. Look at Mark chapter number seven. Mark chapter number seven, like, is every tradition bad? No, every tradition is not bad. Traditions that go against the commandment of God, those are bad. But look at Mark chapter seven, look at verse number seven. But traditions, people find safety, people find comfort in traditions that they've been brought up in, things that they're used to. Look at verse number seven, it says, how be it in vain do they worship me? <clears throat> Teaching for doctrines, the tradition, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. You see that? As the washing of pots and cups and many other such things ye do. And he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. So look, is the problem really the tradition alone? No, the problem is that the tradition, it contradicts the commandment of God. The, tradi the tradition itself is causing people to throw away the commandment of God. So look, you need to check your traditions. You need to check the things in your life that you grew up with, that you're used to, that you just do, because that's a tradition to us. Is that taking a place of the commandment of God? Look at Matthew, um, actually go to... Um, Look at Matthew chapter, go, go one more verse. He gives an example of in, in the next few verses. In Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, I had you in Mark, right? Go to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. Jesus gives a specific example in Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew 7, and look at verse, actually, it's, you're still in Mark. I'm sorry, I got, I got my notes all messed up here. Go to Mark, go back to Mark. Let me make sure I'm correct. Go to Mark chapter 7, and you're going to go to verse number 10. Yes, yeah, so now he gives an example in Mark chapter 7 in the following verses. He says, For Moses said, Honor thy father and mother, and whoso curseth father and mother, let him die the death. He's saying that's what the Bible says. Verse 11, he says, If a man say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say a gift, by what, whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free." And he suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. So here's what they were doing. The Pharisees were like, you don't have to take care of your family if you give the money to us. <laughs> just give the money to us, and then you're just released from this commandment of Moses. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's your tradition. And that's literally nullifying what God said, which it's your tradition, which ye have delivered. And he's like, and many such things do ye. So all these Pharisees were bringing in all these godless traditions that were causing people to have to throw away what God wanted them to do. So we need to check our traditions and make sure that we're not getting comfort in things that are causing us to not trust in God, but trust in the traditions of men. I mean, some traditions in our lives, I mean, I'll just give you a few. I mean, I'll give you some easy ones. All right, I'll give you some easier ones, like the Easter Bunny. That's a tradition that literally is throwing out what Easter is actually about. That's a tradition that, you know, we're following that's literally covering up the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look, I grew up with that. I grew up with that tradition. But look, I don't do that tradition. Some traditions are hard to let go. But we ought to default to the commandment of God. And we should form our traditions from the commandment of God. So you should form your holiday traditions, you know, throw out Santa Claus, throw out the Easter Bunny, throw out you know, Halloween. We, uh, there's a Halloween store that's open today. It's not even August yet, first of all. What in the world? But I mean, 
If that's a tradition, that's an easy one. That one should just go out the window. We're not going to worship Satan this year. We're going to start traditions that are godly traditions. How about this one? Just like birthday parties for kids where it's really just a bunch of adults that get around and just get drunk. There's a tradition that's not valuable. There's a tradition that goes against the commandment of God, but you're like, well, that's just what we do, that's just what the family does, and we don't have to, you know, do the drinking and things like that. It's like, no, 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 just take that one and just throw it out the window. You know, that's a commandment, that's a tradition of men that goes against, you know, the commandment of the clear commandment of God to be sober, to not even look at strong drink, all these other things. Look, here's another tradition. Here's another tradition that people find comfort in, where there is no comfort and there is no safety. Turn to Luke chapter number 12. Turn to Luke chapter number 12. How about this tradition that exists in Egypt, that exists out in the world, that look, it gives a lot of comfort to a lot of people, maybe even Christians today. But it's this, this tradition of unconditional acceptance. This tradition that no matter what you're into, no matter what you're doing, it's fine. You know what, this is infecting Christian churches today, this tradition. And it's going against the commandment of God. Look at Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12. You're like, that just doesn't sound very loving. If you have a red letter Bible, these are red words that I'm about to read you. Luke chapter number 12, verse number 51. Jesus himself says, suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. From henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, Three against two, two against three. Then he talks about how the father and the son and the mother and the daughter and the daughter-in-law, all these people are going to be divided. Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm bringing division. Jesus is saying, no, Christianity, my words, my philosophy, my beliefs, my structure, the word of God is going to divide people. This idea that we all need to accept everything no matter what, look, that's not even true amongst believers. That's not even true amongst believers, much less the world itself. I mean, when I think about this, I don't mean to like, you know, lump a whole generation like into this, but when I think about this, I think about the baby boomer generation, and I'm not trying to hit anybody here, because, but I, I have seen so many people in the baby boomer generation where they started out conservative and they became liberal. And the reason they became liberal was because their children went off into some twisted sin or weird situation and then instead of saying, hey, we failed as parents, they decided we're just going to accept everything. They just became upset, accepting of everything. But that is not the commandment of God. But that's what the world teaches. It sounds good. It sounds good when you see a church building that says, come, come one, come all. Or everyone's welcome here. Look, we don't want perverts and child molesters here. They're not invited here. And they never will be invited here. We don't want unnatural people here. It's never going to happen here, because that's not the commandment of God. That's the tradition of men infecting churches today, just becoming accepting of everything. Whatever you're into, it's okay. The Bible doesn't even say that amongst saved believers. If you're into the, any of the six sins that are listed in 1 Corinthians 5.11, you're going to be put out of the church. But trusting in this philosophy of accepting everything, look, it's, it's a broken reed that will pierce your hand. And it goes against the commandment of God. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. Let me, let me tell you another tradition. And this one I just thought of a couple days ago. Here's another tradition. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. Acceptance of everything is not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, he rebukes Jehoshaphat for accepting the friendship of Ahab, who was a wicked man. And look what Jehu says. Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him, to Jehoshaphat, and said to King Jehoshaphat, 
Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Jehoshaphat didn't separate like he was supposed to separate. And he says, now God is mad at you because you didn't do that. Here's another tradition that I was thinking about when I was thinking about this sermon. Watching sports. That's a big tradition for some people. Now look, you say, Pastor, you're crazy. There's nothing inherently wrong with watching a soccer game. There's nothing inherently wrong with watching a football game. Well, I would disagree with you slightly on that, but the point is this. Typically, you know, watching a football game or watching a baseball game or whatever it is, is just, it's, first of all, it's just a complete ridiculous waste of time, but, you know, you're just exposed to certain things. You're exposed to beer commercials. You're exposed to scantily clad women all the time. You know, well, they're cheerleaders. They're there to make sure that you don't forget which team to cheer for as you get drunk and watch the game. But the point is, this is a tradition of men that goes against the commandment of God. You say, well, you know, you, you, I don't drink and I don't do those things. There's nothing inherently wrong with just watching a bunch of people play sports. And I would agree with that, but I, I was proven right on this this week when I saw it all over the news. I don't know if you saw this, but the Olympics, the Summer Olympics started this week and they had the opening ceremony in France, you know, very godly nation, France. Go look up like, you know, some stuff on the, the president of France and his wife. <laughs> but they had the opening ceremony when they had a bunch of, let's just put it this way, they had a bunch of homosexual men dressed up in drag reenacting the Last Supper with a drag queen um, impersonating Jesus Christ. And people are just, Christians are outraged. Christians are, I was actually happy about it and I'm going to explain to you why but my point is this if you watch that if you didn't see look it's good if you saw it in the news and you're like okay that's ridiculous I don't even need to click on that article but if you were actually watching this is a problem with Christians today they're actually watching that opening ceremony and then they go ahead and they continue watching the Olympics it's like shut it off stop watching it Stop watching, you know, boxing matches where you got some dude, you know, fighting a girl. That's literally what's happening. I mean, just stop watching this trash. Shut this trash off, Christian. You say, what could possibly be the good news about that, Pastor? The good news is this. The good news is this. It used to be where they were secretive about wanting to harm your children. It used to be where they were secretive about worshiping Satan. Now they're just coming out right out and saying, we worship the devil and we want to harm your children. Yeah. I'm happy about that. Look, it's, it's, just, it's just literal, open devil worship. Right in your face. It is open contempt. People, like Christians were outraged and like the Olympic Committee's like, wonderful, that's exactly what we wanted. They literally just love Satan and hate the Lord. At least they're upfront about it. At least everyone can see what it is. No one has this, I mean, if, if you have confusion about this at this point, I, I don't know what's the matter with you. If you're a normal person and you are confused about, you know, who's on the side of Satan and who's on the side of God, even if you're unsaved, like you, there may not be help for you at this point. It is so in your face. And that, for somebody carrying the truth down the street every week, that's good for us. It's a good thing. But Christians complain about it, then they watch it. It's like just throw your TV out the window. I mean, why would you watch one second of anything that has anything to do with that kind of blasphemy? I don't want, look, can you imagine if I was, the, the Olympics on a, on a television in my home? I mean, that's worse than Jehoshaphat. Just supporting that, just seeing the Olympic symbol on any kind of screen in my house, I'd be worried about the wrath of God coming into my home. Because these people literally hate Jesus Christ. They hate him. They hate him. 
These institutions, folks, these philosophies of men, these traditions of men, they are promising complete safety when there is none. There is no safety there at all. Look, go back to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. They said, if it be so. Safety in this life, on this earth, it may or may not be there. If you go to Hebrews chapter number 11, if you go to Hebrews chapter number 11, that's exactly what that chapter is about in the Bible. You may not have every safety and every comfort in this life. Look at Job from this morning. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 13. You say, well, I, I should go to Egypt then, pastor. I should go to the world. No, because they promise safety, but there's none there at all. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 13, talking about all these people that did not see the promises in this life. I'm talking about this world on the earth, your physical life. All these, it says, these all died in faith, verse 13, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What does that mean? What does that mean? They saw the promises, but those promises were never realized? No, no, no. That's not what that means. It means they saw the promises, but they didn't realize them in their lifetime on this earth. That, it doesn't mean they never saw the promises fulfilled. They did not see it in this blip of time that is the eternity that they will have. They didn't see the promises. We're not to go to the world for false security that requires abandoning the Lord. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and here's really the answer. And I don't know who picked the verse of the week this week. I know that, that she didn't know what the sermon was about tonight, but I want to read you the last part of this line too. But look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4. This is your ultimate promise of safety. You're like, I don't know that, Pastor, this deal doesn't sound too good. That I have no promise of safety on this earth. Here is your ultimate promise of safety. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4 in verse number 18. I want everybody to get there and I want everybody to see this because this is the answer. The world, this is the whole thing tonight, folks. The world promises complete safety. There is no safety there. And God, with your physical life on this earth, he may protect you and he may not. So you're already better trusting on God. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 18. It says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto what? His heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says he will preserve you unto heaven. That is the ultimate promise. You have complete safety into eternity. Not just your salvation, but you will receive all the promises into eternity. I can't guarantee that you'll be protected at all times on this earth. That's what God is teaching us here. But you will have that safety in eternity. Look, that's more than we deserve right there. There is no real safety anywhere else. And Jeremiah, as a matter of fact, God told them in Jeremiah chapter 42, he told them exactly what I'm telling you tonight. He said, if you go there for that promise of complete safety, it is completely guaranteed that you will all have the opposite of safety. You will all die. God is saying he wants us to rely on him. And look at the last, the last stanza of the chorus of the verse of the week. He is mine. It says, through the blood he shed for me, safe forever I shall be. He is mine. That is the promise. We have the ultimate promise of safety. God just wants us to rely completely on him. And it's like, hey, if God's going to protect me out soul winning this week, I'm thankful for that. And if he's not, he's not. That's why I've heard many people say, you know, like, oh, man, when it gets bad and all this kind of stuff in the tribulation, we're still going to go soul winning? Well, I don't know. I can't really think of a better place to be and, and want God to protect me than out soul winning. But what if, you know, it's not safe to go soul winning? Well, in that case, in that case, can you think of a better way to go out than, you know, preaching the gospel? 
Man, like bringing the truth to somebody, doing what God, look, because you know what that, that proves that you're doing is just trusting in the Lord. Trusting in God. It doesn't take a real brave person to go out soul winning in 2024 America. I mean, it's not like people, I mean, it's completely legal. Most people are very friendly here. It's like, ooh, we're brave. But no, the, the more the tribulation comes in, the more we will have to rely and trust in the Lord. And if it, if it so be, he may protect us. If not, I have to rely on this promise that he will protect me unto his heavenly kingdom and safe forever I will be. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.